Welcome to the ANU Indonesia Project Global Seminar. My name is Mesita Angreni. I will be chairing this session. Um, I'm hosting this event with uh, Lydia Napitupulu, Mas Arianto Patunru, and Mas Firman. Um, I begin today with acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on the which we meet today and pay my respects to the elders past and present. I extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people here with us today. Um, we are grateful for the support from Australian National University and the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. Um, in this global seminar with the topic of the poverty line revisited, we are going to explore Indonesia's approach to poverty measurement. Um, in the last decade, Indonesia has made a remarkable progress in poverty reduction with extreme poverty reduced to below 2%. In light of this, there has been a recommendation that Indonesia improve its poverty measurement and methodology as well, so that the poverty reduction strategies can be better formulated. As such, in this seminar, we will explore, explore more about Indonesia progress in poverty eradication, um, the possibility for improvement in poverty measurement and what that means to the country's poverty reduction policies and strategies. We have three speakers here with us today, all joining from Jakarta and one from Singapore. Um, first, Pak Ahmad Avensora or Pak Aven. Uh, he is the Director of Social Welfare Statistics at Statistics Indonesia or Badan Pusat Statistik. Um, we also have Sudarno Sumarto. Uh, Pak Sudarno is a Senior Research Fellow in Smeru Research Institute. And we also have Samuel Nur Samsu. He is an economist at the World Bank's Poverty and Equity Global Practice based in Jakarta, Indonesia. In terms of today's seminar, the speakers will speak for up to 20 minutes. I will remind each speaker when you have reached a 15 minute mark. After all speakers deliver their presentation, there will be a Q&A session. Uh, Participants, if you want to raise a question, you can either write them in the Q&A box below or click, click the raise hand button in your Zoom dashboard. And then we will unmute you and you can ask your questions directly to the speakers. Uh, please note that our webinar is also equipped with voice translation from English to Indonesia and vice versa. Um, it is also equipped with auto caption in English and Indonesia. So please find this option in Zoom dashboard. We would also appreciate it if you can answer the polls that popped up in your screen um, to improve our seminar seri series. Um, as such, without further ado, I'm calling upon our first speaker, Pak Ahmad Avenzora, who is currently serving as the Director of Social Welfare Statistics at Badan Pusat Statistics. Um, with a Master of Economics from University of Indonesia, Pak Aven has worked in statistics in Indonesia for over 30 years now. Before serving as the Director of Social Welfare Statistics, he led the Subdirectorate of Social Vulnerability Statistics, as well as Section for Analysis of Economic Statistics. Uh, Pak Afan has contributed to a number of publications and delivered courses on poverty measurement methodology, as well as poverty profile and census in Indonesia. Um, so Pak Afan, uh, 20 menit, waktu dan tempat dipersilahkan. Ya, baik. Terima kasih, Bu Nesita. Selamat pagi, Bapak-Bapak, Ibu-Ibu sekalian, Pak dari INU, kemudian para narasumber, Pak Sudarno, Pak Samuel dari Bank Dunia. Baik, dalam pagi ini saya akan menyampaikan bagaimana BPS menghitung kemiskinan. Jadi ukuran kemiskinan yang selama ini dihitung, Nanti bagaimana ke depannya mungkin nanti akan ditanggapi oleh uh, Pak Darno atau atau uh, narasumber lain Pak Samuel dan sebagainya. Izin bisa bisa ditampilkan slide-nya. Bu Nesita mungkin bisa dibantu bisa ditampilkan atau saya share screen sendiri? Um, Pak Aven bisa share sendiri atau bu butuh bantuan kami Pak? Oh ya baik, share screen sendiri juga tidak apa-apa, boleh. Oke, okay, terima kasih Pak. Ya baik, ini kita sampaikan eh, penghitungan kemiskinan di Indonesia yang sampai dengan saat ini kita lakukan. 
Jadi kita coba dengan uh, pertama bagaimana histori, histori uh, BPS menghitung kemiskinan sejak kapan dan sampai saat ini bagaimana metodenya. Jadi BPS sudah menghitung kemiskinan sejak tahun uh, sudah cukup lama tahun 1976 dan yang terakhir kemarin itu tahun 2023 uh, kondisi Maret itu baru dirilis angka kemiskinannya di tanggal 17 Juli. Jadi sudah cukup lama sekali BPS menghitung, menghitung kemiskinan dari tahun 76 dengan beberapa perubahan metode. Jadi pada pada awal tahun 76 sampai 90 kemiskinan dihitung dengan secara konsep konsepnya tetap sama menggunakan konsep kebutuhan dasar pendekatan kebutuhan dasar di mana kemiskinan didefinisikan sebagai ketidakmampuan dalam memenuhi kebutuhan dasar minimum. Nah, tetapi bagaimana kita menghitung kebutuhan dasar minimum tersebut itu yang berubah beberapa kali begitu. Di sini ada tiga kali paling tidak tiga kali perubahan. Yang pertama pada tahun 76 dan 90 kita menghitung garis kemiskinan di mana komponen garis kemiskinan itu adalah garis kemiskinan makanan atau food property lain ditambah garis kemiskinan bukan makanan. Garis kemiskinan makanan itu setara dengan 2100 kilokalori ya. Nanti kita kita apa kita ini secara umum terlebih dahulu kemudian di 93 96 ada ada improvement dari penghitungan garis kemiskinan seperti apa. Kemudian di tahun 998 ada improvement yang kedua bagaimana kita mengukur garis kemiskinan. Nanti kita lihat lebih jauh. Nah, ini kita lihat uh, frekuensi dan level estimasi dari kemiskinan di Indonesia. Tadi saya sampaikan bahwa kemiskinan dimulai dihitung sejak tahun 76. Pada periode tahun 76 sampai tahun 87, penghitungan kemiskinan itu dilakukan tiga tahun sekali. Tiga tahun sekali sesuai dengan ketersediaan data survei sosial ekonomi nasional untuk modul konsumsi. Nah, tiga tahun sekali dan level penyajiannya hanya pada level perkotaan pedesaan dan total atau urban rural dan total urban rural secara nasional. Kemudian pada tahun 90 mulai disagregasi pada level provinsi meskipun di tahun 90 itu masih belum lengkap 27 provinsi. Masih kurang lebih 17 atau 18 provinsi ini masih termasuk timur-timur ketika itu. Ya. Mulai 93 sampai 99 penghitungan kemiskinan itu sudah masih dilakukan tiga tahun sekali, tetapi penyajiannya di disagregasinya sudah bisa sampai level provinsi lengkap. Provinsi lengkap seluruh provinsi bisa dihitung. Nah, ada kemajuan lagi. Mulai tahun 2022 penghitungan kemiskinan dihitung pada level distrik, kabupaten, kota. Jadi sampai sampai saat ini, sampai sekarang. Kemiskinan dihitung baik pada level nasional, pada level provinsi, dibagi, dipecah menjadi urban, rural, urban plus rural. Kemudian pada level kabupaten kota tidak bisa dipisahkan urban plus rural, jadi hanya hanya total. Ya kenapa? Karena pada pada level kabupaten kota sampelnya tidak cukup untuk mendisagregasi di urban dan rural. Nah, ini dilakukan dari tahun 2002 sampai 2010 itu dirilis setiap tahun satu kali. Nah, di 2011 itu ada kita lebih lebih sering lagi menghitung kemiskinan yaitu satu tahun dua kali. Dirilis satu tahun dua kali yaitu kondisi Maret dan September gitu. Ya, ini mulai tahun 2011 sampai dengan tahun 2022 kemarin. Nah, tahun 2023 ini baru dirilis yang bulan Maret ya. Nanti yang bulan September karena susunasnya tidak dilakukan ini mungkin kemungkinan hanya sekali saja. Nah, tadi sudah disampaikan bagaimana BPS menghitung kemiskinan. Yang pertama konsep terlebih dahulu. Ini juga konsep yang sudah dibanyak dipakai di banyak negara yang juga direkomendasikan oleh UN yaitu konsep dari kemiskinan adalah kemampuan dalam memenuhi kebutuhan dasar. Jadi di sini pendekatannya adalah pendekatan kebutuhan dasar, basic needs approach gitu. Sehingga dengan kebutuhan dasar ini kemiskinan dipandang sebagai ketidakmampuan dalam sisi ekonomi penduduk untuk memenuhi kebutuhan dasarnya. Kebutuhan dasar itu diukur dengan apa yang disebut dengan garis kemiskinan. Ada dua garis kemiskinan, garis kemiskinan makanan ditambah garis kemiskinan bukan makanan. 
Nah, kita mendefinisikan garis kemiskinan makanan itu apa? Nah, sesuai dengan uh, hasil dari Widya Karya Pangan dan Gizi di tahun 1978 bahwa kemampuan seseorang itu minimum harus 2.100 kilokalori sehingga itulah batasan yang digunakan untuk menghitung garis kemiskinan makanan yaitu rupiah yang dikeluarkan setara dengan 2.100 kilokalori per orang per hari. Nah ini nanti akan dikonversi menjadi suatu nilai uang, nilai moneter gitu. Itu garis kemiskinan makanan. Kemudian garis kemiskinan bukan makanan atau non makanan adalah Kebutuhan minimum seseorang untuk memenuhi kebutuhan perumahan, pakaian, kemudian pendidikan, kemudian kebutuhan dasar bukan makanan lainnya, ya misalnya angkutan, transportasi dan sebagainya. Nah, setelah mendapatkan garis kemiskinan makanan dan bukan makanan, diperolehlah total garis kemiskinan. Nah, dari garis kemiskinan yang diukur dalam rupiah per orang per bulan maka dari data survei sosial ekonomi nasional itu akan diketahui diperoleh angka kemiskinan berapa persen orang miskin di Indonesia di provinsi dan berapa orang jumlahnya ya, jadi eh, hasilnya adalah jumlah dan persentase orang nah ini metode yang digunakan terakhir itu di, eh, dilakukan eh, penyempurnaan di tahun 98 ya jadi tadi ada periode tiga periode pengukuran 76 sampai 90, kemudian 90 sampai 298 dan 98 itu diimprove lagi yang sampai di, yang digunakan hingga saat ini. Nah, kira-kira gambaran dari bagaimana menghitung kemiskinan e, seperti ini visualisasinya bahwa di situ ada garis kemiskinan tadi disampaikan garis kemiskinan itu di, diukur dengan ekuivalen rupiah setara 2.100 kilokalori. Ketika kita menghitung rupiah eh, ekuivalen dengan 2.100 itu, kita menggunakan ada 52 jenis komoditi. 52 jenis komoditi yang banyak dikonsumsi oleh eh, penduduk kelompok marginal. Ya, Di sini ada beras, ada beras ketan, dan instan, tahu, tempe, dan sebagainya. Termasuk rokok. Jadi ada 52 jenis komoditi di mana 52 jenis komoditi itu dihitung kalorinya, kemudian disetarakan, di, diperoleh harga kalori, harga rupiah per kalori, berapa satu kalori itu harus dikeluarkan rupiahnya. Nah, kemudian eh, harga kalori tersebut dikalikan dengan 2.100 kilokalori, karena anchornya yang kita gunakan di negara kita ini adalah 2.100 kilokalori per orang per hari. Negara lain juga menggunakan hal beberapa negara menggunakan pendekatan yang sama tetapi kalorinya berbeda. Ada yang 2150 dan sebagainya. Nah, untuk Indonesia kita masih menggunakan 2100. Itu untuk untuk garis kemiskinan makanan. Kemudian yang kedua adalah garis kemiskinan bukan makanan. Garis kemiskinan bukan makanan tadi disampaikan adalah jumlah dari kebutuhan minimum pengeluaran perumahan dan sebagainya perumahan, listrik, kemudian eh, pajak kendaraan bermotor, pendidikan, kesehatan, dan sebagainya. Ada sekitar 50, 51 item komoditi di perkotaan dan 47 item komoditi di eh, pedesaan. Nah, ini gambaran visualisasinya. Di situ, di garis merah itu adalah garis kemiskinan yang diperoleh dari penjumlahan garis kemiskinan eh, makanan plus bukan makanan. Ada garis, kemudian yang di bawah garis itu eh, adalah penduduk miskin. Persentasenya adalah jumlah penduduk miskin dibagi dengan jumlah penduduk Indonesia secara keseluruhan untuk yang nasional, untuk yang provinsi tentunya jumlah penduduk eh, miskin provinsi dibagi dengan jumlah penduduk provinsi. Nah, nah ini eh, nanti kita masuk ke metode bagaimana menghitung garis kemiskinan lebih teknis. Jadi eh, kita coba misalnya ini kita lewati, kemudian kita lihat ke alurnya. Ini alurnya flow chart dari garis Bagaimana kita menghitung garis kemiskinan? Nah, secara teknis menghitung garis kemiskinan di Indonesia yang selama ini kita lakukan adalah kita mempunyai garis kemiskinan tahun sebelumnya, periode sebelumnya. Nah, selanjutnya kita kita melakukan perkiraan garis kemiskinan kondisi saat ini, yaitu dengan mengalihkan garis kemiskinan periode lalu dikalikan dengan inflasi. Dapatlah apa yang disebut dengan garis kemiskinan sementara atau tadi di slide sebelumnya itu adalah garis kemiskinan periode sebelumnya dikalikan dengan inflasi dapatlah suatu garis kemiskinan sementara 
Nah, dari garis kemiskinan sementara itu diambil di atasnya sebanyak 20% di atas garis kemiskinan sementara untuk penduduk referensi, populasi referensi. Nah, dari 20% penduduk populasi referensi itu dicari, dihitung, basket komoditi ke-52 jenis basket komoditi tadi berapa kalorinya, berapa rupiahnya, berapa harga kalorinya untuk 52 jenis komoditi tersebut. Nah, dari situ diperolehlah garis kemiskinan makanan. Demikian juga untuk garis kemiskinan bukan makanan. Dari kelompok populasi referensi yang sebanyak 20% di atas garis kemiskinan, itu di, dihitung berapa uh, kebutuhan minimum untuk makanan, untuk, uh, untuk uh, perumahan, pendidikan, dan transportasi, dan sebagainya. Nah, dari kelompok referensi ini, maka diperolehlah garis kemiskinan uh, makanan dan bukan makanan. Nah, untuk selanjutnya, uh, kemudian diperolehlah penduduk miskin adalah penduduk yang berada di bawah garis kemiskinan uh, total, ya, makanan plus bukan makanan. Jadi, flowchartnya seperti ini. Ya, lanjut. Nah, ini. Nah, ada tiga indeks, ada tiga indeks uh, kemiskinan yang biasa kita sajikan. Yang pertama, Favorty Head atau Head Count Index. Yang kedua, Favorty Gap Index. Kemudian yang ketiga adalah Severity, Severity Index. Gitu. Ini semua didasarkan atas rumus FGT, FGT Index, di mana di situ rumusnya seperti ini, ada alpha di situ. Alpha, kalau alpanya, jika alpanya 0, itu artinya Head Count Index, yaitu persentase penduduk yang berada di bawah garis kemiskinan. Apabila alpanya 1, itu adalah indeks kedalaman atau property gap index. Property gap index itu adalah sejauh mana kira-kira rata-rata pengeluaran penduduk per rata-rata per kapita pengeluaran penduduk miskin itu jaraknya ke garis kemiskinan. Kemudian alpha kalau alpha 2 itu namanya adalah severity index. Severity index itu adalah bagaimana kira-kira variasi kelompok penduduk miskin, variasi pengeluaran per kapita kelompok di antara kelompok penduduk miskin itu sendiri. Nah, ini ada dua ada tiga indikator yang biasa kita hitung, headcount index, property gap index dan severity index. Nah, kemudian nah ini saya akan menyampaikan profil di kemiskinan di Indonesia. Ini yang pertama karakteristik dari garis kemiskinannya seperti apa? Beberapa tahun sampai sejak sampai saat ini komposisi dari Garis kemiskinan makanan itu sekitar 74 persen. Ini tidak hampir tidak banyak berubah ya setiap tahunnya. 74 persen sekitar 74 persen untuk makanan dan sekitar 26 lah ya 26 persen untuk yang bukan makanan. Nah, jadi seperti ini. Ini setiap tahun kira-kira seperti ini. Hanya kisarannya mungkin 73, 74. Nah, apa namanya polanya masih seperti ini. Nah. Untuk tahun yang yang angka kemiskinan yang dirilis kemarin, untuk garis kemiskinan itu ada peningkatan secara nasional sebesar 2,78 persen, yaitu dari Rp535.000 per kapita atau per orang per bulan menjadi Rp550.000 per orang per bulan untuk daerah perkotaan dan pedesaan secara total. Untuk daerah perkotaannya, itu ada kenaikan 3,07 persen, yaitu dari 552.000 menjadi 569.000, dan untuk daerah pedesaan meningkat dari 513.000 menjadi 525.000 rupiah per kapita, atau naik 2,3 persen untuk di daerah untuk daerah perdesaan. Nah, ini beberapa komoditi yang berkontribusi untuk kepada garis kemiskinan. Untuk makanan, untuk makanan yang paling besar kontribusinya ini setiap tahun terjadi ya adalah beras ya beras dan rokok. Kita lihat ini setiap tahun ini beras dan rokok itu menempati peringkat satu dan peringkat dua berkontribusi terhadap garis kemiskinan. Untuk tahun 2023 yang baru saja dirilis kemarin kontribusi beras sebesar 19,35 persen di urban dan 23,73 persen di rural. Rokok 12,14 persen di urban, 11,34 persen di rural. Di kelompok bukan makanan, yang paling besar kontribusinya adalah kelompok pengeluaran perumahan. Ya di daerah urban 8,81, daerah rural 8,38. Kemudian yang kedua listrik 
kemudian eh, bensin, pendidikan, dan seterusnya. Ya, ini gambaran dari beberapa jenis komoditi yang mempunyai sumbangan terbesar terhadap garis kemiskinan. Of nah, kap, ini kurang 4 menit lagi, mohon maaf saya potong. Baik, ya, baik terima kasih. Nah, ini gambaran uh, tren selama uh, dari ta dari tahun 2015 ya sampai dengan tahun 2023 yang baru dirilis kemarin. Pada umum uh, secara umum menurun hanya beberapa terjadi kenaikan ini dikarenakan juga uh, ada Covid pada saat itu di Maret 2020 menaik, September menaik, kemudian menurun lagi di Maret 2022 ke Maret September 2022 uh, meningkat sedikit kemudian menurun lagi. Ini gambaran ini kemudian yang kedua P1 atau P2 poverty gap index dan poverty severity index juga mengalami penurunan relatif menurun untuk poverty gap index dan relatif tetap untuk severity gap index ya yang atau P2. Nah ini beberapa karakteristik kemiskinan di Indonesia bisa kita lihat bahwa di sini masih terjadi ketimpangan yang lumayan antara daerah perkotaan dan pedesaan. Ya, di Maret 2023, 7,3 persen daerah kota, 9,4 persen daerah pedesaan. Kemudian juga ini ada perbandingan antar pulau, juga ketimpangannya lumayan. begitu Di Kalimantan hanya 5,67 persen, Maluku Papua 19,7 persen. Nah, ini beberapa karakteristik yang umum yang bisa kita lihat dari data susenas untuk karakteristik kemiskinan. Yang pertama tadi disampaikan, ada ketimpangan di antara provinsi dan pulau, kemudian juga ketimpangan antara daerah perkotaan pedesaan, kemudian secara distribusi itu 54,7 persen kemiskinan ada di daerah pedesaan, kemudian karakteristik rumah tangganya pada umumnya adalah apa, pendidikannya itu SD ke bawah, kemudian kondisi perumahannya, jenis lantainya sangat kualitas, sangat rendah, kemudian dalam pekerjaan, pada umumnya ada di, di sektor pertanian, sekitar 50 persen di sektor pertanian, kemudian informal sektor juga di atas 50 persen, jam kerjanya sedikit, kemudian eh, untuk garis kemiskinannya tadi sudah disampaikan, kontribusi untuk makanannya eh, paling, eh, lumayan tinggi, kemudian untuk komponen berasnya masih tinggi, dan eh, rokok, kemudian eh, non-foodnya sekitar 24 persen, dan didominasi oleh perumahan. Oke, itu. Terima kasih. Mungkin itu yang bisa disampaikan. Selanjutnya kami kembalikan ke Bu Nesita. Terima kasih, Pak Aven. Uh, participants, if you have questions to Pak Aven, you can type them in the Q&A box or note them for later discussion. Um, now for our second speaker, uh, we have Mas Sudarno Sumarto. Um, Mas Darno holds a master and doctoral degrees in economics from Vanderbilt University. Um, Mas Darno has an extensive knowledge in poverty economics. Um, he is a senior research fellow at Semeru, but also he is serving as a policy advisor at the National Team for the Acceleration of Poverty Reduction, or TNP2K. Uh, his research focuses on economics, development, poverty, and social policy. He has also been involved in a number of research projects in poverty reductions, which includes developing a multidimensional poverty map in Indonesia, which can be used as a tool to target poverty reduction and social protection programs. Um, Mas Darno, 20 minutes, the time is yours. Thank you, Nesita. Selamat pagi, selamat siang. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Please allow me to speak in English, kawan-kawan. Uh, uh, we have many audience from Australia, I believe. So first of all, I would like to thank ANU Indonesia Project for inviting me to this important webinar, especially Mas Acho, uh, Mas Firman, Esita, Lydia, and colleague from ANU. I'm very grateful for the opportunity. It is such an honor for me to be in the same panel with my dear friend, Pak Afen from Single Pick of Statistic and also a colleague from the World Bank, uh, Samuel, in which we have been working together. Don't worry, I think 20 minutes is fine. I can do it. <laughs> so I will share the screen later. I think this is a, such an important topic, and I'm very happy that the NU brought this into uh, the public domain so that we can discuss together and finding the solution 
uh, especially to uh, be more uh, uh, accommodative to what people outside has been thinking all along about these issues. So please allow me to share my uh, pre presentation. This is uh, what I'm going to talk about. But basically, today I would like to uh, share with you a reflection, a few re reflection on the poverty line, which is the result of my past work with my colleague, including from PPS, but and included from the World Bank, the NP2K, Smeru, Hippialatas, and, and many more, on the importance of setting the poverty line, which has an implication for policy making decision. I think Pa Afen already explained very clearly about the way how PPS has been uh, counting the poor. Uh, but it's been there for the last more than the last two decades. Actually, I myself was involved during the 1998 revision that was uh, just after the uh, Asian financial crisis, together with colleagues from PPS, from Papanas, and also Professor Len Pritchard and Meno Pradhan at that time. Uh, where it's nothing wrong, it's nothing fundamentally wrong, what Pa Afen mentioned using a basic need approach, 2100 kilocalories an anchor. So if people think this is arbitrary, not at all, this is uh, an the anchor is 2100 kilocalorie. Where that number came from, it came from this uh, meeting of the expert panel of uh, nutritionists and also health people at the LIPI who recommended. With 2,100 calories per capita per day, people will be able to do their activities. You know, if you're a pitch-up driver, you can do your work. If you're a farmer, you can flow. If you're a researcher, you can think and write the paper, for example. So, however, however, this has been uh, philosophically discussed for quite some time with colleagues from PPS. Uh, the methodology that Pap just mentioned is methodologically, methodologically consistent from time to time. However, it is a weekly absolute measure. What does it mean? If it is weekly absolute measure, it makes it very difficult for government, for policymakers to measure whether their policy is actually working or not. Why do we call it weekly absolute measure? Because Pap already mentioned. Uh, every time, every year, the next year, you adjusted your reference population, you know, from the, let's say, what is the poverty line in 2023? 20, 2023 poverty line in March, for example, it was generated using the 2022 poverty line, then you inflated with the CPI, and then you upgraded that 20% above it as your reference population. What does reference population means? Reference population is the type of the consumption that people usually consume to get that 2100 kilocalorie. If we you most of them, most of you are probably economists. So basically, at the end, this is P time Q, the price time quantity. The quantity has to be 2100 kilocalorie, but the P is different. You know, pa acho pa. But uh, Birman actually consume more high quality calorie, which will cost you more than if you are in the bottom 10%, for example. You can fulfill with the 2100 kilocalorie with only eating rice plus uh, salt, uh, 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 salted face, for example, or with a very simple vegetable. You will get 2100 kilocalorie, but it will cost you probably one month per month for 300,000. But Pa Acho and uh, Pa Verman and also Lydia and also Nesita consume with 2100 kilocalorie, but they are eating fish, they are eating salmon, they are eating uh, uh, steak, you know, uh, Australian steak. It will cost you the 2100 calorie for about 1 million a month. So that, that's the logic. That's the logic of why we need to think very deeply and how do we need to go about these issues? It's not easy, and I'll, I'll tell you one by one, just very, very briefly. Okay, let's just set the state I'm very brief on this one. Despite all of the concern that I have, Indonesia has done a great job in reducing poverty over the last two decades and more. At the peak of the Asian financial crisis, poverty increased double, 11 to 25, more than double, about 25% in 1998. And then the first time the history of the Republic, poverty reached a single digit, 
this was the record that Ibu Sri Mulyani used to say in March 2018, where poverty reached about 9.82, and then increased again because of the COVID-19, and now it's not recovered back to the pre-COVID. So this is an issue that we need to work on. Um, and mostly driven by economic growth. Growth is critically important for poverty reduction and also the expansion of social protection program. So understanding the how consequential poverty line is in determining budget and also policy. So I would like to save our case to look at more detail on the poverty line itself. So we are doing great, but probably uh, uh, more can be done about it. But why do we need to revise a bit on this one, uh, Afen and colleague and, 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 and all of the audience? First of all, I think there's been a change over the last two decades, more than two decades, you know, the last, the last poverty revision was 1998, as I said, and I was involved, part of that, with Paasep and my colleague. And over the last 20 years and more, actually, there has been change in consumption pattern. If you look at this table, simply saying that the share of food expenditure has decreased, this is an effort, not only the poor, by about 12 percentage point. And mostly the change is on the prepared food. The prepared food is, has a firm implication on the way how poverty is being counted. And then the grain, especially the rice, actually dropped by about 10 percentage point. On the other hand, the non-food consumption has also shifted, especially for housing and, and also many other stuff. And the basket was also mostly based on, you know, in the, the old consumption pattern. It does not include like people now spend more money on porn, you know, on silver, on, on uh, <clears throat> pulsa and, and LPG and, and things like that. So if we were to revise our poverty line, what need to be taken into account? What, what are the criteria? Here are the great criteria that we would like to adjust our poverty more consistently. First, it has to reflect, it has to reflect the life and the consumption pattern of the poor. So this is the so-called the reference population. So we are not measuring the consumption pattern. We are measuring the poor consumption pattern. And it has to be statistically robust. It means that, you know, RSE, relative standard error, has to be fulfilled and has to be statistically uh, coherent and also consistent. And finally, the consistency is important. Again, the consistency is critically important because we would like to know whether our intervention is actually working or not. Otherwise, it's going to be very difficult to, to, to compare. So now I would like to, you know, see what happened. I think uh, this is, I just took it from uh, uh, the bank recent poverty uh, report, uh, World Bank Poverty Assessment Report. This is just an uh, indication. It's not necessarily true. If you look at this, so you can put your line at, for example, 1.9, 3.2, 5.5, and then you compare with our national poverty line. You can see here, I think uh, the more consistent welfare measure is, the, I think it, it's a bit steeper in terms of the change over time where our line is relatively flat. The dot line is actually the change over time of poverty, national poverty line. So this is something that we can work out. Why it happened? Because the bank method is using the simply loss fair index, you know, adjusting with the price uh, of the basket, but relatively the same basket over time. So I think that's what makes this change different. But this is, uh, if you look at this, uh, the blue one, the blue one is 3.2. So it doesn't matter if you would like to put 3.2 dollar, be it. Or even if you'd like to have higher, uh, Professor Arif used to criticize our line is too small, it's too low. That's great. Let's have a different line, you know. But the way how we measure whether the government is working properly in the of addressing it is to see over time whether the change is consistently over time uh, or not. So... Uh, how we compare the poverty as implication of policy. This is, I already mentioned at the beginning. So the, the, the four issues here is that if you don't have any uh, welfare consistent poverty measure, and then it's going to be very difficult if your intervention is working. That's number one. Number two, if your intervention is not working because you don't have a clue about what work, what doesn't in terms of what kind of what characteristic and what are the proportion of food and non-food allowance. And then... If that's the case, and then you will see the spurious poverty trend, whether it's actually, uh, you know, up, uh, overestimated or underestimated. And then as a result, the allocation of resources of the budget, because we don't know exactly uh, 
what kind of the commodities uh, deemed to be critically important for the pool. So now, uh, and then maybe colleague from ANU asked, you know, what have you been doing so far? Because you're working with the PBS. I'm a member of State Technology Forum with uh, uh, Pa Birman as well. Actually, we have tried, we have tried, and we are we are still working on it. And the five issues that I'm going to go through very very fast. Uh, uh, Nesita is is on the sample size, and then the consumption bundle, variation of the price between region, and then the reference population. The important. Uh, because it's not straightforward, seemingly straightforward, but it is not the case. And then is how can we construct the non-food poverty line? We know the food poverty line is using 2100 kilocalorie, but how about the non-food allowance? Because there is no such standard as a non-food allowance, right? Okay, so the first issue is about the sample size. I think colleague from PPS, I'm also part of PPS, you know, have my time spent in the past with PPS. Uh, the problem has always been the sample size is too small. In the past, it was only about 200. Now we already have about 350,000 sample. But that's still very difficult in terms of having a representative sample. And the way how PPS calculated is using uh, provincial urban rural uh, prices and commodities. So the way how we resolve this one is let's just do it once every year, whether it's on March or September, by having more si sample size, let's say 400 or 450. This is number one issue. Number two is on the consumption bundle. Uh, this is very easy also to compare because our bundle changes every year because of the sufficiency of that bundle in that district, in the province. So we can use a last pair. We agree about, let's say, 52 commodities consistently used every year. And then we revisit it every five years, for example. The three issue is the five Variation. This is simple. I think PPS has already done this one. In the past, uh, uh, we use this uh, average prices, uh, and we see the differences across this uh, province in Indonesia. And then uh, we suggested that instead of using average, they have to use the median. I think they already adopted this one. And this uh, reference population, I said, the reference population is critically important. The way how uh, uh, the existing method is calculated using 20% above it. So it's not necessarily the consumption pattern of the poor. So it's above the poor line. So we suggested to use the poor and near poor. Let's say 10% above the uh, preliminary or KKS or Kairis Kamiskin and Shmantara. And finally, the non-food po uh, po poverty formula line. Uh, this is also uh, very elusive in terms of, in the past, we used this uh, survey with one does as PPKD 2004, but I believe uh, I've been already changed this uh, with the new method, uh, with the new survey. But still, there are some arbitrariness uh, in terms of what commodity is being used as an anchor for the non food allowance. So we suggested in the past to apply the uh, angle curve a la Bidani and Rafalian, which basically is saying that the non food poverty line is actually an average of the non food allowance from the population uh, who's whose expenditure is equal to the poverty line. A bit abstract, but basically this is a regression of your angle curve of your food consumption, and then you can find that number. So those are the issues that we all see know the uh, solution. Uh, and we have uh, been trying to, despite all of this effort for the last couple of years or a decade, uh, during Papadio no vice presidency and said, hey, okay, let's do it after the new government. I was very keen about having this as well, but uh, sometimes uh, techn technically we can resolve, but politically can be very complicated uh, simply because of the issue of, you know, uh, pet dependence. What does it mean? Because when we change the poverty line, there will be some up and down in some region, especially. For the national poverty line, it didn't change that much. Maybe one percentage, two percentage point can be up and down. And then when you distribute it across province or even district in Indonesia, you can have a different variation. And this makes a life difficult in explaining to them because this is also one of the, you know, um, indicator for, for their the way how they're governing their institution. So we have to find the choosing the right time, hopefully the upcoming government. And also con this is the, you know, what we are having right now is important so that we have a buy-in from scholar or uh, international renew expert. In the past, we worked with uh, uh, my dear friend, late Martin Rafalion, and previously with Kudat Duff, and he was working very closely with us on how to do it better, make it more absolute. 
Um, and we can also have a two measure, you know, PPS can continue doing what they are doing right now, which is great. It's okay because they are uh, methodologi methodologically consistent, but to have a welfare consistent, you also have another line, for example. I think Ch China did it in the past for that one. So we're keen working with PPS. Of course, this is a PPS uh, jurisdiction. Uh, we cannot dictate what PPS so and not do, but we have to work with PAFN and team to you know reform and making it better. Uh, so I think that that's all what I would like to share with you. Again, this remain elusive, and uh, we have tried our best, and uh, we have documented. And again, I think most the most of the issue is about the pet dependent. So bear in mind, PPS are very, very, very inclusive and they're willing and they are very open minded to do so. But again, you know, it's a provincial what happened, you know, if, for example, now a single cell property is about slightly above national property line, let's say 10 percent. Then with the new line, we have 12 percent and it's going to have some impact on uh, Mr. Governor or same thing with East Java or West Java and things like that. So there must be some mitigation about how can we explain, maybe and your colleague can help, how can we communicate this kind of uh, information, you know, so that uh, uh, we can work on it in the in the informing. So ignoring politics will only lead to delay reform and miss opportunity to enact change. So uh, you should be mindful. I think uh, many of you are understanding. But thank you so much. I'm sorry if I talk too, too fast. And that's what I can share with you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. North. That was really great. Um, I already see a couple of questions being asked and hands being raised. Please keep them coming. But in the meantime, let's call upon our last speaker, Mas Samuel Nur Samsu. Mas Samuel holds a Master of Science in Economics from the University of Wisconsin-Madison and completed his undergraduate studies uh, in economics at Universitas Indonesia. Currently, Mas Samuel serves as an economist in the World Bank's Poverty and Equity Global Practice based in Jakarta. And before joining the World Bank, Samuel worked at a several research institutes based in Jakarta, including Semeru, Area, and the Nielsen Company. Uh, Samuel has an extensive research experience specializing in data analysis and econometrics. Um, his recent publications include a piece explaining the difference between relative and absolute poverty um, and the impact of socioeconomic disparity on learning engagement during COVID-19 pandemic. Um, Samuel, uh, without further ado, 20 minutes, the time is yours. Thank you, Basita, and good morning to Padarno and Pak Afem. Thank you for, first of all, thank you for uh, Pak Acho, uh, Bu Lydia, and also Basita, uh, everyone from the Indonesia Project for inviting me. And I think we already heard a very good presentation before from Pak Afem and also Padarno about the technicalities of the poverty line. And this, uh, in this opportunity, I would like to present a more general picture about uh, the condition of economic uh, uh, poverty reduction in Indonesia and how does it link to the poverty measurement because the condition now has changed and in, in spite of that, there's also still some issues and there are still several steps needs to be improved in terms of poverty measurement. So first of all, I think this is already uh, talk by Padarno, uh, we know that extreme poverty was nearly eradicated in 2022. Uh, we reached 1.5% uh, in 2022. And this is a very remarkable progress because, as we can see, in 2002, we have 19% of extreme poverty uh, based on 1.9 2011 PBP uh, USD. And now it is only 1.5%. And even with a broader definition of poverty, Indonesia still made a remarkable progress because if you can see that 3.2 in the uh, yellow line, it starts at six, 61% and now it's, uh, it's declined to 16% in 2022. So uh, poverty dropped starkly here in the last two decades. And Poverty reduction has been also broad based uh, because this is a lot because it allowed most lagging regions to catch up, except for the rural areas in two provinces. So first one is 
poverty in urban areas fell from 46% in 2002 to 16%, and in rural areas, 73% to 16%, which is a really uh, big reduction in the last two decades for rural areas. Uh, although there are still two lagging regions here, Nusa Tenggara and Maluku, Papua, which saw their poverty rates decline by 50 percentage point from 80 percent to 30 percent, and also uh, and also still it is uh, it is still higher than the rest. Uh, it is uh, it is still considered a lagging region, but still it is a remarkable progress also for Maluku, uh, Nusa Tenggara, and Maluku, Papua. And, and we come to, although we have this uh, issue of the, we, we have this remarkable progress, but what's next after this? So how does this compare to Indonesia regional peers? So even though we have successfully reduced to nearly zero uh, poverty, extreme poverty, but if we look, if we compare to the country peers like Philippines, uh, Vietnam, China, Malaysia, and Thailand, we can see that the progress, although it's been great, uh, if we see the $1.9, 1.5% uh, is uh, similar to Vietnam and even lower than Philippines and uh, closer, than Mal uh, in Mal for closer in Malaysia and Thailand. But if we see the 3.2, uh, we still have uh, some works to do because we still have 16%. And while our country peers like Vietnam has lower 6.6% and Malaysia is nearly zero and also Thailand. So while the, while the pace of poverty reduction is comparable to peers, the poverty rate is slightly above other country peers in this case. And, and also if we look uh, in, in terms of economic insecurity, we see that around a third of Indonesians and half of non-poor remain economically insecure. So what does it mean to become economically insecure? So economically insecure is uh, people that are generally non, uh, not in the poverty, but they have a strong likelihood uh, above 10% to fall, to fall into poverty in the next year, or uh, people in, now is categorized as poor, but in the next year can raise into non-poor uh, non -poor individuals. So we have the structurally poor and also economically insecure. So in the structurally poor, uh, between structurally poor and economically insecure, there are two uh, main difference. So the first one is the structurally poor have too low physical assets or human capital endowment to graduate from poverty. So they remain poor, uh, they are likely to be poor in the next year because of this endowment is uh, lower in this case. While economically insecure are susceptible to falling into poverty due to shock. And the shock is, uh, can be anything, can be poverty shock, can be climate shock, uh, can be external other external shock like COVID, for example. Uh, so, because we still have this issue of, although we have nearly 0% extreme poverty, we still have this issue of building economically resilient society. And in this case, burdening focus to those whom economically insecure and socially poor will be important in building this economically resilient society. And um, we can see that the economic insecurity exacerbates already low productivity. Uh, sectors that are contrib contributes a lot to poverty reduction is uh, still agriculture agriculture, especially in rural areas. But if you can see that agriculture and low value added services are not enough to improve economic resiliency because uh, the status of uh, poor people is still people that are employed in agriculture sectors. So although they are important drivers for poverty reduction, but the work is not sufficient to improve economic security. And in this case, high skilled jobs remain scarce, limiting economic security. Uh, additionally, if we look at the economically insecure households, they can be forced to adopt adverse coping strategies. So in, in, in terms of uh, if there are shocks like climate shocks, uh, there are natural disasters, for example, uh, COVID-19, they are prone to sell their assets uh, and also their capitals. And in terms which 
can lower the productivity in this case. So we still have a lot of work to do in terms of this uh, security. And to, to, dig even per, to dig even further on the shocks, we see that the, there are external shocks that threaten poverty reduction progress, and it affected disproportionately uh, larger to those who are uh, economically insecure. So first, the most recent one is COVID-19. As you can see, COVID-19 uh, actually affected consumption growth of those who are better off in urban areas. So it's not just about the poorest. It's not just about the 1.5 percent. It's not just about the extreme poverty, extreme poor, or also or also poor. But it can be uh, this economic insecurity is much larger than that. So people that people that are perceived are better off can still be uh, susceptible to this kind of external shocks. And also the second one, there's a climate change that will increase the frequency and severity uh, of natural shocks. So we know that there are, uh, we, we, we saw and we also observed that there are a lot of uh, increasing frequency and also increasing uh, magnitude of natural shocks, which disproportionately affecting poor households, especially in agriculture. So uh, if you can see from the graph in the middle, there's an estimated agricultural yields in 2030. And you can see that there, there's a big uh, expected slowdown or reduction in terms of agricultural yields. And from the previous slide, we know that agricultural households is where the poverty pockets are. So. Uh, yeah, this is this this climate change will disproportionately affect poor people more. And the third one is also the re the most recent one. We have the global uncertainties, the trade war, and also Ukraine Russia war, and other stuffs going on in the world, which triggered high volatility in prices, which also disproportionately affecting lower income decile. So as you can see from the graph on the right hand side. We see that the purchasing power uh, by income decile and consumption categories that is <laughs> affecting uh, more in the in the in the in the lower income decile, but less in the top decile. So, what do we do now in the, in terms of improving economically secure economic uh, resiliency? So. The first thing that we need to do is to improve the social assistance. So the social assistance coverage can be improved to protect Indonesians against poverty. But in terms of social assistance, there's much work to do. So the first one is, uh, although the government rapidly scaled up social assistance, reaching more beneficiaries and increasing the level of benefits, but not all households uh, in need receive benefits. Also, the benefits are not always adequate in this case. So even among the bottom 40 or less than 40% received uh, benefits from the expanded social assistance programs. Uh, so, uh, so the bottom 40 is still receiving less, uh, less than 40%. And there are also several issues of mistargeting where people that are not really in need of uh, social assistance are kind of like receiving it, uh, receiving it higher than it must. So there are still uh, the problem of mistargeting. So now we can see that uh, this is also in our report in poverty assessment. So if you are uh, curious about the recommendation, so we have four uh, big recommendations. So the first one is creating better opportunities. And the second one is protecting against poverty. So creating better opportunities means uh, more jobs, more high quality jobs in this case. And the second one is protecting against poverty, improving the coverage of social assistance and uh, protecting people from these external shocks, for example. And the third one is financing proper investment, which means more efficient spending and uh, uh, the use of fiscal to improve the social assistance in, in this case. And the fourth one is the, the thing that I will discuss if further is to improve future policies, which means to increase the use of good data, to increase the utilization of data and improve the uh, kind of like fine tuning the methodology of this uh, poverty measurement and also targeting 
to improve efficiency for the future policies. So, which comes to the topic of the tools to measure poverty. So improving the tools to measure poverty uh, and vulnerability can make poverty reduction policies more effective. So the first one is uh, coverage of your targeting database can be expanded beyond the bottom 40% to include all households. I think this also has been done uh, through the socioeconomic registry, Rexosec, that BPS and also Bapenas and, yeah, and the other ministries uh, already done. And also the targeting accuracy can be improved in this case. So it can be through regular updating of the targeting database and calibrating the eligibility criteria to uh, fit the needs of poor or economic insecure, economically insecure households. And the third one is, which I want to elaborate further, is the necessity of an absolute measure of poverty that includes uh, special price special price deflation in this case. So I think this topic has already raised by Padarno before. So uh, I'll kind of like refresh it a little bit. So we have two indicators. We have two poverty lines that uh, commonly used in Indonesia. The first one is the, is the international poverty line, which the government has mandated the use of 1.9 per day, uh, 2011 PVP USD. Uh, as a measure of extreme poverty. And the second one is uh, the national poverty line, which has already explained really clear by Pa Afen. So there are, these two uh, has different approach, which are used uh, for different purposes. So the first one, the international poverty line is an absolute poverty line. So it's 1.9 per day. Uh, using 2011 PVP for low income, there's a 3.2 uh, per day for the lower middle income, 5.5 per day for the upper middle income. This number is taken from the average of group of countries. So for the low income, the 1.9 per day is taken from the 15 uh, countries, 15 poor countries, and the 3.2 per day is taken from the lower middle income countries, the the, poverty, the national poverty line, the and then we harmonize the national poverty line, and then we take the average of the national poverty line to get the 1.9, 3.2, and 5.5. This is in the spirit of making a comparable uh, approach to, to compare the poor, the, the poverty rate between countries. So actually the purpose is not, is not to measure the poverty in a national level because we don't have the comparability in subnational level in this case. So for example, in Indonesia, the only comparability that we, comparability that we can push is to urban rural Indonesia while we are lacking appropriate special deflation for, for provincial level. Well, on the other hand, the national poverty line, as Padano said, is a weekly relative poverty line and it's a moving standard. So it's always increasing uh, twice a year, always updated. And it is a moving standard because the reference group of the 20% uh, among provincial urban rural, and it makes, uh, it makes the poverty line difficult to use, to be used uh, as a comparability between provinces and urban rural. And in that, in in this case, in the poverty assessment, we tried to introduce. Sorry, Bas, you have four yes. or more minutes, if that's yep. okay. Thank you. Yes, and yeah. So because of the lack of absolute poverty line to produce comparability comparability between provinces, we are we are trying to introduce the spatial uh, deflator in the poverty assessment assessment report. Report. This is still a uh, kind of like early progress, work in progress. We working together closely also with Padarno and Paafen and from Kemenko PMK in this case. Uh, so basically, we are. Uh, <clears throat> so the Susanas has the consumption module, the food consumption, and the consumption module. Uh, we used the food consumption aggregate to spatially deflate at the province level. Um, the special food deflators, uh, which are taken from Susanas, um, uh, we 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 take we we take only the item on the food food consumption items, and we create the special deflator. So basically, that's that's the idea of it. Uh, why we only 
use the food uh, food items because the non food uh, lack the consumption of the the quantity consumption in this case and it's kind of like the limitation of this method because the around 40 percent of consumptions in indonesia cannot be spatially deflated which is composed by the non-food items and the spatial deflation is anchored at the existing national urban rural poverty rate and as you can see if we are spatially deflating the uh, 1.9 usd per day we can find a quite big difference between if we're trying to uh, implement the 1.9 per day to the province urban rural level. So you can see the most stark difference is the green line here, which is Maluku, Papua. So if we are not spatially deflating the 1.9 and we can just, uh, we just applying this 1.9 without uh, controlling of uh, price difference in the Maluku, Papua, Maluku Papua uh, poverty rate will be uh, captured in the very low level, below 5% here, nearing Sumatra, I think. Yes, Sumatra. But if we especially deflated uh, the province in the province level, we can see that Maluku Papua rate is increasing much higher. I think it's above 5% here. So it can make a big difference. And it also shows that uh, Indonesia is not really well integrated in terms of prices. So that's why uh, if we want to have the absolute poverty line, it is, uh, it is uh, important to think about this partial difference, which I think also mentioned by Padarno. So yeah, this is my presentation and thank you. Thank you, Ma Samuel. That was a really great presentation. Um, right on time. Thank you speakers for sticking to the time um, limitations. Um, we Let's head on to the Q&A session. But before that, if the participants can just answer the polling that just pops up, that would be really appreciated. Um, I think for the first questions, the the cigarettes being a uh, food category in food basket, a poverty food basket, that really raises eyebrows in our participants. We have three questions about that. Um, Mas Yogi has a questions, um, a clarification question. Is tobacco if, if tobacco is categorized as food food consumption, how much calorie allocated for its consumption? And there are a couple of questions of why cigarettes are still included in the food basket today. Um, maybe uh, Pak Aven bisa menjawab pertanyaan itu. Jadi berapa kalori yang dialokasikan untuk rokok dan kenapa masih ada di situ rokok di food basket itu? Ya, yeah. baik. Terima kasih. Beberapa pertanyaan saya lihat tadi uh, menanyakan tentang rokok gitu ya rokok, sigaret itu kenapa masuk ke pangan. Jadi pertama kita kita ini, apa namanya sampaikan dulu bahwa kenapa rokok masuk sebagai bandel komoditi kemiskinan bahwa rokok itu banyak dikonsumsi oleh orang-orang miskin. Jadi kalau saya lihat baik itu di kelompok miskin, menengah maupun kelompok kaya itu rokok itu banyak dikonsumsi di situ sehingga itu dianggap sebagai kebutuhan dasar gitu ya kebutuhan dasar untuk eh, apa namanya penghitung kemiskinan. Nah, itu alasnya kenapa rokok masuk bandel komoditi kemiskinan. Nah, kenapa, sekarang pertanyaannya adalah kenapa rokok masuk ke bandel eh, bandel eh, makanan. Betul rokok tidak ada kalorinya, tetapi kami mengacu kepada klasifikasi yang namanya koikok. Koikok bahwa rokok itu sigaret itu masuk pada kelompok makanan, tembakau dan minuman gitu. Nah, itu dasarnya. Nah, ini eh, meskipun pada penghitungan kalorinya itu kalori eh, rokok itu nol kalorinya. Ya, tetapi tetap masuk sebagai basket komoditi dalam menghitung kemiskinan karena rokok itu adalah dianggap sebagai kebutuhan dasar karena banyak dikonsumsi oleh kelompok-kelompok marginal, kelompok eh, near poor dan bahkan kelompok eh, kaya pun demikian. Ini boleh eh, sekalian itu Bu Nesita ya ada beberapa pertanyaan yang saya baca ter tentang Jogja ya. Jogja Boleh Pak, silakan. Nah, ya, um, Yogyakarta, yeah. Provinsi Yogyakarta itu kenapa tingkat kemiskinannya paling tinggi di Jawa? Itu juga pernah ditanya. Itu itu pertanyaan yang memang sering ditanyakan. Kalau kita lihat indeks pembangunan manusia itu menunjukkan 
angka yang uh, lumayan, malah ranking satu atau dua kalau tidak salah di, di Indonesia. Kemudian indeks-indeks yang lain pun, Jogja itu menunjukkan uh, uh, yang bagus begitu, angka yang bagus. Tetapi kenapa kemiskinannya malah justru uh, tertinggi di Pulau Jawa itu, 11, sekian persen kalau tidak salah atau 10, sekian persen. Kita tahu kalau kita ke konsep kemiskinan, bahwa kemiskinan di Indonesia ini, kita masih menerapkan konsep kemiskinan adalah pendekatan kebutuhan dasar. Ya, pendekatan kebutuhan dasar itu apa-apa saja yang kita konsumsi. Jadi konsum, konsumsi. Nah kalau kita lihat di Jogja itu, kami pernah diskusi dengan orang Jogja, malah BPS Jogja juga sudah meneliti, memang konsumsi konsumsi orang-orang Jogja itu, masyarakat Jogja itu memang eh, tingkat konsumsinya, apa namanya, tidak setinggi di Jawa di provinsi Jawa Barat kemudian Jawa Timur kemudian Banten DKI bahkan nah Jawa Tengah Jogja itu selevel sama Jawa Tengah lah kira-kira perilaku konsumsinya seperti itu sehingga Jawa Tengah dan Jogja itu dalam angka kemiskinan itu mirip-mirip begitu ya nah itu karena itu karena kita menghitung kemiskinan masih berdasarkan konsep konsumsi bukan konsep mungkin MPI MPI multidimensional property index yang me, me, apa, mengkompositkan suatu indikator-indikator tunggal menjadi suatu indeks begitu ada anda pendidikan ada kesehatan ada uh, daya beli nah kalau MPI kalau menggunakan MPI kemungkinan Jogja itu akan tingginya nah kemudian apalagi saya kira itu uh, Bu Nesita mungkin nanti bisa ada taman dari Pak Darno dan Pak Samu oke okay, terima kasih Pak Aven Mas Darno do you want to add Comments about the cigarettes? Questions? Well explained by Pa Aven. Actually, we excluded that. There's no calorie in in cigarette. But again, so the approach is uh, is a consumption based measure of poverty. So to reflect how much do they consume, how much do they spend. At the end, it's about price time quantity again. Uh, but still, they have to come up with 2,100 kilocalorie and then they add up uh, cigarettes is uh, because, again, they, they consume a lot. They use that a lot. But I know there are some implication about this one uh, in terms of, you know, why uh, because cigarette is not uh, politically correct thing to be included in the way how we measure progress. But uh, if you did not include that, I think poverty is going to even... Uh, getting worse because you know you did not record what they spend and they already spend money for that uh, it's a different story if you would like to not include that one but again this is the baseline has always been including the cigarette yeah mas yeah kemudian juga ada pertanyaan tadi ya uh, in, in the chat talk about uh, the issue that we are having and how Pak Aven and I responded to how to improve better poverty measurement I think we have outlined about the, the way how we need to move forward of improving the poverty line, you know, by, you know, we are actually already exercised about the number with Pafen also, yeah. What happened if we only increase the reference population 10% above the uh, preliminary poverty line? Okay, guys, yeah, guys, kemiskinan sementara. I think we will have much lower poverty. And the same thing, what happened if we have a fixed bundle? Fixed bundle, let's say, you know, 50, 58 bundles, and then we use the same bundle for five years, and then we inflate it with the CPI in the, in the province and what happened. We have all the numbers uh, again, and we already with Pafen at that time, actually, we already submitted and reported to uh, the Minister of Papanas as well. And during the discussion there, Papunki, when he was a deputy, and then the uh, you know, discussion came again. So that's why this webinar is important again because of the way how we sometimes, you know, why don't we just use a local commodity, you know? Because people in in Semarang, near Semarang, yeah, somewhere in Boyolali, they eat a lot of down kelor, for example. That also has a lot of calorie and things like that. So people would like to have a, you know, locally peace measure of consumption. That's a good idea. But if that's the way how we sell poverty, and it's not going to be comparable because people in Kapumen probably didn't eat that much down kelor. So this is story. And with regard to Jakarta, this is a very unique, you know, one day I presented to the king of Java, uh, Ngar Sodalem, uh, Sultan Hamangupuono, and he was complaining to PPS. You know, PPS, kenapa bisa begini? I think we are better off than Jawa Tengah and Jawa Barat, but our poverty are much higher. And you have to know, he said that. Uh, 
Actually, orang Jogja itu lebih senang, you know, spending their their money to feed their cows and their animal instead of you know using one their own consumption or things like that. So it's culturally has some implication also. So it's a big uh, a question here. So I I I trust what Pa uh, Aven said. If we use a different anchor, let's say MPI, because they have a much higher life expectancy and also education achievement in the, the quality of education. Chukcha is the rising star. Uh, we did that third study in Chukcha. The second one is in uh, uh, Sumatra Barat, uh, somewhere in Bukit Tinggi. Uh, but if you look at the consumption piece measure, it's actually worse. So we need to start thinking as well from the future, not only about calorie. Let's think about something like probably we need to start looking at the protein and you know more of the you know other commodities, not only using calorie as an anchor, but other other things, for example, you know, uh, because people now diversify their product a lot and not necessarily has a low quality, low calorie, but a high protein, for example. So this is something that we can work as an academic and uh, researchers to uh, look at beyond what we already have right now. Gitu, Nesita. Jadi kalau Jogja yeah. memang unik ya. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mas Darno. Mas Samuel, do you have any comments specifically on the um, how the poverty line can be made more methodologically robust? So yeah, thank you, Basil. I think I think the answer to this is very com complex, and there's no right or wrong answers in this case because I think this is already uh, explained by Padarno that uh, in in terms of poverty measurement and poverty line, there's there's a lot of different purposes in this case. So I think what what we are trying to do here is to uh, to measure something that we can fit to the policy purposes in this case and to give us the clearer picture uh, in terms of how to capture poverty um, and it can be varied across uh, across across countries in this case so for example indonesia by measuring the living standard uh, moving living standard here is not wrong and also uh, because it serves the purpose of uh, improving the improving local policies because it is used uh, mainly for the local policies and for the international poverty line is also used for its purpose uh, is to compare between countries. So I think it's different here. So we also have the multidimensional poverty which also compares or include another access of services or basic uh, needs in this case and also probably there are some other cases of including nutrition values in this case, as Padano said, not only calories, but also other uh, like proteins, vitamins, I don't know, like that, that kind of thing. So um, in terms of improving robustness in this case, I think we can check on what do we want to measure and what are the policy implications here in this case. So I think uh, this is one thing that uh, it's important to consider. Thank you. Uh, we have Sandra here raising her hand. Uh, Sandra, if you want to talk, you can unmute yourself and ask directly your questions to the speakers. Sandra? Okay. Maybe she changes her mind. Um, Right. Uh, Yogi has another question. Um, to Pak Darno, if the calculation is being changed, then the methodology needs to be applied retrospectively to have a comparative basis for measuring uh, progress, doesn't it? Um, in terms of cross-district province comparison, how is the price differentials uh, considered into the estimations? Good question, uh, Yoga. Yes, definitely. I think the way how we, uh, you know, exercise with the proposed methodology is always looking back. You know, you backcasting about, let's say, if you are using uh, 2009 as your baseline of benchmarking, and then you, or any year that you took, and then you 
looking back what happened in the past and also what is the future. So we always doing the backcasting. I think that's very common. BPS but often doing it in during Park Kachu uh, leadership. He also uh, changed the national account calculation, uh, working with the APS, Australian Bureau of Statistics, uh, national, uh, national account. Uh, also looking at backcasting and also with the new methodology. That's number one. Number two, uh, the way how we, again, uh, we didn't change something fundamentally different. Uh, we will still be, we, we are also proposing the same way of uh, counting the poor by using, you know, reference population, urban rural, using the deflator that we have been using to construct the uh, poverty line, uh, uh, the price implicit in the Susanas, and then the that's the provincial urban rural. We have been doing that for many, many years since the beginning, you know, 98 is exactly what Pa already mentioned. So actually, if you ask how many poverty line in Indonesia, it's about 100, right, Pa about 100 poverty line. You have a provincial, 52 province, and then you divide it within urban rural in that province. That's the way how Pa'afen job is very complicated, very difficult. You know, he sleepless every time he has to come up with the number and has to make sense. And that's the way. And then uh, the next question is how, how can you do it at the district level? That's a very, very complicated uh, methodology. I think Pa'afen has done it. Actually, we there is an issue about sample size in, in the district level. Uh, the way how we calculated the uh, poverty over the years, and we are still working on it right now. You're seeing a more special uh, small area estimation in a poverty map uh, we have been doing so far. But uh, uh, the algorithm of the way how PPS has been doing uh, district level poverty line uh, is a bit uh, uh, complicated, but mostly using the implicit price in, in the Susanas itself. So because there is no CPI uh, deflator at the district level, as you know, the deflator is only, you have it only in uh, 60 cities, it's an urban, and then even rural is also being questioned. But we also have an implicit price defla uh, deflator within that Susanas itself. What does it mean? It means because you have the consumption, you have the price that you pay, and then you can you can track that how much does it cost in over time what is actually the inflation at the district level something like that it's technical but uh, i think uh, you guys also technical guys so basically uh, there are many algorithms that we are working now it's a very challenging but i think paapen has done it many many years but only paapen and who can do that i cannot replicate this number <laughs> maybe paapen mau nambah pak tentang kemiskinan Kabupaten, Pak, ya. Silakan Pak Aven jika ada komentar um, terkait uh, komparisi antara uh, garis kemiskinan di setiap provinsi yang berbeda-beda. Iya, ya, terima kasih. Ini tadi sudah disampaikan Pak Darno. Saya kira uh, tadi kita melihat paparannya Pak Samuel ketika uh, garis kemiskinan yang sama diterapkan ke seluruh provinsi begitu. Nah, akan jauh ber, akan sangat ber, akan sangat tidak masuk akal gitu ya. Tadi Papua kalau tidak salah Maluku ketika menggunakan garis kemiskinan yang sama nasional diterapkan ke Maluku Papua itu akan rendah. Kenapa? Karena tingkat harga di Papua itu tinggi gitu ya. Jadi eh, itu yang perlu kita harus mencari semacam deflator. Deflator untuk masing-masing provinsi urban rural dan deflator untuk kabupaten ketika kita menghitung kabupaten ini yang sangat sulit apalagi kalau sudah menghitung kabupaten di level provinsi karena sampelnya masih oke okay, gitu untuk level provinsi itu masih tidak serumit apabila ke level kabupaten kota ketika kita masuk ke level kabupaten kota tadi Pak Darun sudah menyampaikan kita perlu mencari berbagai metode algoritma untuk menghitung tingkat harga antar kabupaten kota. Bagaimana perbedaan tingkat harga misalnya di DKI Jakarta di di Jakarta Selatan, bahkan di Jakarta Selatan di Jakarta Timur pun akan berbeda tingkat harganya. Apalagi kita bandingkan Jakarta Selatan dengan Papua, dengan Jayapura di situ, dengan Merauke di sana. Itu yang memang cukup rumit sehingga memang pada level kabupaten kota 
BPS biasa me, me, apa, merilis itu dua atau tiga bulan kemudian setelah rilis angka uh, provinsi dan nasional. Ya, itu itu uh, untuk ke level list agregasi kabupaten kotanya. Banyak metode algoritma yang bisa dipakai, tetapi juga karena keterbatasan sampel di level kabupaten kota itu yang menjadikan kita juga harus mencari berbagai uh, metode begitu. Itu saya kira. Oke, okay, terima kasih Mas Aven. Um, Mas Budi juga mau bertanya. We have a question from Budi Reso Sudarmo. Uh, Pak Budi, if you can unmute yourself and ask your questions. Yeah, thank you, uh, Sita. So I would like to follow up Mas Darno uh, suggestion that academics should come up with uh, different method in term of calculating a national property line. And I, I think I think that is important uh, suggestion. Uh, there are uh, one requirement I think that is also uh, important to mention is that we might want to um, to reduce the monopoly uh, 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 the monopoly uh, that only BPS that can say how many poverty in Indonesia. So that is actually also uh, important because because if it is not then. Uh, all this methodology cannot really push down. The, the, the second issue that also discourage people, I think, to calculate poverty, uh, because one of uh, what we interested mostly on, on academic is looking on how exactly we could calculate beef below district level, below Kabupaten. Now, however, Susan since 2014, take out the ID for village and kaupaten. So that actually discourage uh, uh, many academic to be more critical. Uh, so that's two things. Oh, would you be agree that we probably should reduce the monopoly of WPS to say who, how many uh, poor people in Indonesia? And second is that uh, BPS need to be more open to allow us to go beyond the standard that they they monopolize basically which is the data below district level thank you pak aven mau berkomentar soal ini jadi uh, pak budi bertanya kalau misalnya ad, apakah mungkin kita bisa menurunkan monopoli dari bps untuk men menentukan um, garis kemiskinan itu seperti apa dan gimana caranya kita bisa lebih BPS lebih bisa terbuka lagi misalnya dengan akademik atau dengan researcher um, terkait dengan siapa yang menentukan poverty line ini. Ya, terima kasih Pak Budi. Terima kasih. Ya. Ya, jadi, uh, ya itu mungkin nanti bisa kita sampaikan ke pimpinan karena itu arah apa arah kebijakan dari pimpinan. Saya kira kalau kami sendiri sih selalu terbuka dengan akademisi Kemudian juga metode juga kita selalu uh, apa, uh, diskusikan dengan masyarakat statistik FMS di sana di situ Pak Darno Pak Firman juga kalau tidak salah sebagai anggota metode apa metode yang kita pakai apa metode perbaikan metode yang akan kita gunakan nantinya itu juga selalu dikomunikasikan dengan forum masyarakat statistik di mana FMS itu juga isinya adalah akademisi akademisi kemudian uh, uh, dari pemerintahan juga dan dari praktisi gitu saya kira. Seperti itu kita BPS selalu terbuka begitu. Kemudian tadi saya kalau tidak salah tangkap memang e, untuk level ke agregasi yang paling bawahnya se, e, ke, di bawahnya kabupaten. Kabupaten saya susunan sendiri memang di desain samplingnya hanya sampai pada level kabupaten kota begitu. Itu pun tidak bisa dipisahkan untuk e, e, urban dan rural. Nah untuk ke level kecamatan itu sebetulnya bisa saja kita menggunakan small area estimasi. Uh, dengan model apa model yang sudah ada gitu dan itu sudah dilakukan kalau tidak salah oleh badan pangan nasional uh, penghitungan indikator pada level kecamatan ketika menghitung uh, apa indeks kerawanan pangan indeks kerawanan pangan itu ada level pada level kecamatan saya kira itu juga mungkin kita bisa diskusikan dengan akademisi bagaimana uh, metode small area estimasi kita juga sedang belajar metode itu kita di situ bisa bisa mengundang akademisi dan sebagainya untuk memberikan 
uh, apa, uh, apa namanya teori-teori tentang uh, small error estimation itu mungkin uh, Pak Bu uh, Bu uh, Pak Budi, uh, Terima Pak kasih. Resita. Terima kasih Pak Aven. Mas Dono, do you have any comments, especially on your slide about how we can bring together TNP 2 k BPS, and other researchers that we can get a buy-in on from them um, to do this better in the future? We did virtually. Sorry, I missed you during your last visit to Elsa. So I think you should invite us, you know, to Canberra. Mas Aven and his team in the bank <laughs> get together, talk about this, you know, bring all of the expert. Again, you know, I think technocratically, you know, I think we can solve the issues that we have been talking about, raising about, but we have to move forward, I think. I think it's been quite some time, you know. Uh, I think during the FMS, you know, like this. I think the APS also have similar FMS. I think Indonesia is very unique that actually there is, this is the law, the a decree or presidential regulation or something like that, that we, we I think, including uh, Firman is like an overseeing body of PPS to suggest. So yes, Pak Budi, I think we know your grievance. There have been complaints to my colleague at PPS that they no longer have even the district code and also village code, which is very important for researchers to understand the dynamic of the policy making process. But again, I think there is a there is a way like Pak Aven. I think if you can you know reach out Pak Aven and the team uh, for research purposes, I think they will allow you to have access to that information. But but I understand, you know, PPS did not release that publicly in their dissemination because, you know, everybody can access internationally and sometimes it's uh, very difficult. And with the monopoly, actually, yes, of course, I think PPS did not monopolize, actually, but I'm not depending on Pavan, but actually because you can persist that Susan has the same data, no one is collecting data as big, as extensive as Susan has, except the uh, uh, Birman, yeah. Uh, with uh, IFLS, even IFLS is not as big as Susanas either, we be very complete. So everybody can buy that data, can construct their own poverty line, can report, can tell, but as long as they are credible and we have, I think that's what the bank did actually, the bank put any line, they were not any line, but they have also some justification, but sometimes it's mostly methodological, it does not reflect about something, you know, it mostly, technical yes of course if, if, and, and you would like to you know colleague have a you know and you poverty for example so people sometimes misled about this information in the press so menurut bank dunia angka kemiskinan is one bank dunia nggak pernah ngumpulin data kemiskinan ya pak bank dunia membeli data susenas they put their line and then they this you know they came up with that number you know, 1.5, you know, extreme poverty almost disappear, is close to disappear, things like that. Kitu Pak Budi, I think uh, this is good because we have access to Susana, Susakarna, you can, you know, the NUN team can have your own algorithm. You can put it in that and then you can explain why we have, we prefer this line than the PPS line because of one, two, three, four, something like that. Yeah, that, that's my, but it's good. I think Pak Budi just opened our eyes also, Pak, Pak Aven juga untuk terbuka dengan teman-teman, karena meskipun mereka di Canberra, tapi kan juga namanya Indonesia Project ya. Artinya is memikirkan Indonesia juga. So I think we have to be very open. <laughs> Kalau enggak nanti di personal non -dratakan. Thank you, Pak. Sorry. All right. We are towards the end of our session, but we have one questions please do it briefly mas firman uh, you can unmute yourself and ask the questions yeah, yeah I, I i just want to add that uh, you know I, as mas dano said I, everyone can calculate their own uh, uh poverty line including in using uh, we, we want to for example welfare consistent one the monopoly is not in producing the mono, uh poverty line but in which poverty line is going to be used for policy that's the issue right we can have Three, yeah, if, yeah, I, I think that that's the issue, whether policy should be based on which uh, poverty line, that's what, what matters at the end. Yeah, thank you.
Thank you, Mas Firman. I think that closes the seminar really well. Um, uh, with that, I'll give the floor to Lydia Napitupulu to close the event. Thank you. Thank you very much again, uh, Sita, and thank you for all speakers. Maybe we can take a brief photo. Uh, smile, everyone. Three. Uh, anyone who wants to, okay. Three, two, one. Cheers. All right. Thanks. And before I close, let me share um, our event, uh, probably the biggest event of the year for Indonesia Project, which will be in Canberra, the Indonesia Update. Um, if you want to attend in Canberra or online, uh, you can do so. Registrations are open. Thanks again, everyone. Thank you, uh, Mas Darno and Pa Asura. Thank you, juga uh, Sam. Terima kasih Mas Budi, terima kasih Neza. Terima kasih semuanya. Terima kasih semuanya. Sehat-sehat ya. Ya Pak Darno. Terima kasih ya. Good good job Mas. Mas Rafael dan terangkan dunia. Terima kasih. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you. See you Sam. Terima kasih. See you Pak. Bye. Thank you Pak Jo. Thank you Pak. Thank you.